Dear friends, I'm glad to welcome everybody here. It's already 10 p.m., 10.01, on Friday, 25th of March, and this is our next live show with Alexei Aristovich. Glad to see you here. Likewise. Uh, two hours. Uh, we've been uh, waiting for two hours, and uh, we got 65,000 people watching. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I was uh, uh, traveling. All right, let's talk about uh, what happened during this day, and then I'll tell you about what happened in Moscow, what Moscow is telling us. Frankly, nothing major happened today. Um, fights in the same areas with the same results. There was a missile strike near Vinitsa. Initially, they're reporting no victims. We practically succeeded in kicking them out of Nikolaev region and uh, switching to Kherson. In Mariupol, we killed one of the main commanders. In Kharkov, we did a counterattack. Chernigov is being pushed pretty hard. They're trying to, it seems like they're trying to make a second Mariupol out of it. And uh, one of our journalists was wounded there. He's a very well-known journalist and military correspondent. Yeah. And that's all that comes to mind. So what's happening in Izum? The town was not taken. It's kind of stable. Is it still separated? Yes, it is separated in halves uh, by the river. Our troops keep the higher part, and uh, Russians are keeping the lower. So today, one of the generals of Minister of Defense did claim that they do have some losses in Russia. Minister of Defense, uh, they announced they lost 1,350 people or so for the whole period of war. We saw three numbers from them. One was zero casualties, another was about 500. Now they're saying it's 1,500. Let's say this progression, What? Uh, how can you explain that? They're trying to explain the ones that they brought back to Russia and the, the funerals you see there, which are probably at least three times bigger than what they announced initially. How do you explain that? Um, very simple. I think it's our data and similar data coming from other people and more information coming from Ukraine. It's uh, impossible, however, you put Russia in the information bubble, they, it'll still seep out. There are a lot of results. Uh, you have about a million views. Uh, my interviews have their effect. It's uh, reasonable to consider that people uh, still get this data. And especially if the difference is several times, at least. So they went uh, on a compromise and said, uh, yeah, let's make it at least two and a half times more than they said initially. It, it actually batches kind of the graph of time that passed, so they kind of multiplied that. So if nobody pulled them and pushed them with our data, uh, they would still continue avoiding the information. I uh, suspect so. Uh, so you see that pulling actually matters. Um, Okay, I'll be agree with you. Those people who bury their relatives, who get those death notes, they count at least, you know, 10, 20 other burials like that in their own region. And uh, if you multiply that by different regions, you can see the picture. And there are different kinds of uh, people dead, uh, those who... Those who are the contract, those who are professionals. Do you know how they did before that? For eight years before that? They were pulling people to serve from very different parts of Russia. So funerals would be coming not to one or two neighbor regions, but would be spread throughout the country. And even now, by geography, you can look at the whole country and see that there are six bodies there, 12 bodies here, five bodies there. 
Uh, our analysts who look at the picture, uh, even small towns that have, you know, 25, uh, 40,000 citizens, they already got two to three bodies. And if you calculate throughout the country, that's a humongous number. And, you know, some examples, we got a battalion tactical group. Um, from the Northern Fleet, about 600, 648 people, 600 something. And um, there are only three of them that are alive now. Uh, two are wounded, only one is uh, intact from all of them. So where did they all die? They used them in the OSAC zone, and most of them uh, died hitting the prepared defense, uh, mostly there and also near Kharkov. So there are mostly two areas where they were uh, destroyed. Another uh, 7th uh, Storm Division from uh, Novorossiysk. Uh, soldiers from one of the divisions, over 50%, wrote their papers saying they're not eager to participate in that conflict. So it was a big scandal and they refused to go. And um, yeah, another group was in uh, Rostov. Some of the uh, special police forces also refused. But 12 people and they got an attorney and uh, it became a news now. So people are starting to understand that, that it's an insane war that they do not need. So basically, yeah, these are the silly ideas of several people in Kremlin for which uh, thousands are dying. People disagree with that. And, and another was a surprise of the commander of the 49th Army. Yeah, the 10th time we covered them in Chernobyevka, uh, that uh, general lieutenant died there, and it's hard to hide it. Uh, people are also interested with uh, Kherson. Any perspective there? Uh, Pentagon was already happily announcing today that we already got Kherson and kicked everybody out and controlled the city. Uh, this is not true. This is not correct. We did push them uh, to the right bank of Dnipr, but uh, it's a big exaggeration to say that we control the city. So let's imagine sooner or later Kherson becomes free. How big of a catastrophic effect may that have on Russia? Because that's the only regional center that they actually occupy now. And what if they lose it? Yeah, frankly, they're not really occupying that city. Yesterday, our people put the big Ukrainian banner in the center of the city on the administration. Russians uh, still keep trying, activists, mayors, uh, other people, and uh, they're telling that from the 1st of April, it'll be Russia here. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a good fairy tale that from the 1st of April, Russia will, it'll be a Russian city. So if we'll take it, it'll, I think, have a catastrophic effect because, uh, Kanashenko will have to, some explaining to do how they lost her son. He'll probably be saying they have not lost it. It will be a catastrophe for the whole Russian direction. Because then the group near Nyukahovka and Energodar, they're also getting pushed after, and we're cutting off their supply lines. And uh, the group near Mariupol will be also in a bad position because we'll be approaching it. It'll be a lot of grief for them. Um, it's not simple. It'll be difficult to do, to achieve all these goals for us. Uh, so it will not happen. The taking of her son will not also happen like tomorrow. It'll take some time. Um, now, situation around Kiev, uh, different sources are saying different things. Moscow says that they're successful. Other people are saying that uh, Russians got thrown away. I have to uh, admit uh, we have not pushed anybody too far. They have encirclement remains, have encirclement. There was no uh, further advancement because there are still a lot of Russian forces around Kiev and it's a position war between our armies there. Um, we should not be waiting for quick success there. Uh, we push them a little bit to the place where they are. That's already good. 
to the campaign. But as for their propaganda, it's interesting to listen to, because you can deduce that the program, the whole goal of their campaign is changing. And they yeah, bravely said the first goals of campaign are completed, uh, as if we don't remember what initially they were aiming for. Now, uh, instead of one special operations, they got stages, and uh, now we can actually speak to them. And we can reveal to the people in Russia, uh, says Minister of Defense, that uh, these are the goals and that's what we're going to do. So the question is, uh, why are you so uh, modest? If you only lost 1,400 people and uh, barely achieved these steps, what's happening? Because even on, on their level of the official propaganda uh, and bullshitting, it's hard to uh, really say that that's what we initially planned, that we're just following to the everything is according to the plan. You can even see that in uh, one of the shows of uh, propagandists in Russia on Soviet on his shit show where he says and where he talks about the war in Ukraine and he says that oh the second army in Europe is not Russian it's Ukrainian and uh, yeah they were telling us that uh, Ukrainians um, you know don't know how to fight they're just oppressors of their own people and that's one of the features of the propaganda that, that's when they're saying that the enemy is at the same time is strong and weak when they're making statement that their uh, silly army is worthless and they don't know how to fight and then immediately say that people prepared by NATO in Ukraine their army is uh, preventing our advance and we're losing our troops and their animals and we have to seriously fight with them suffering losses it's basically following Orwell's uh, blueprint 1984 or two kinds of truth exist. So, yeah, these two thoughts exist in their heads simultaneously, and nobody even wonders how can that be, that in two neighboring uh, sentences there can be exactly opposite information. So I had a, a message from Andrei Piankovsky, uh, but now Skabeva, another propagandist in Russia, uh, that she's stating there was no goal, we just went there to protect those two little republics of LNR and DNR. You can actually bring up their shows from the 24th, 25th, 26th of February, and uh, they'll be saying very different things there. So comments about the negotiations. What do you think? Kuleba, the Minister of International Affair, Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, that there are no... Um, a big progress in uh, the talks, in the peace talks. And he was uh, basically stating that Moscow wants everything and Ukraine would not give them anything. Today there was an interesting statement uh, from a Turkish journalist uh, that Erdogan uh, had spoken with Russia and NATO and agreed upon demilitarization and other things. The only thing they did not uh, agree with was Ukraine. And there are some uh, specific people in Ukraine, uh, as well as in Russia, who believe foreign uh, journalists more than their own. They somehow imagine that that data takes precedence over what their own people are saying. Very strange people, but they're kind of ideological descendants from USSR if uh, those voices had said something that is so. Um, I'm glad that mostly people are uh, somber and they take this data with a grain of salt and they did not believe that Turkish journalist. Kuleba is basically right. We have taken a principal position of defending our values and I would say that both sides uh, have created and agreed upon the table of uh, disagreements and that can only be resolved if presidents maybe meet on the upper level.
к Украине, то есть представители каждой политической силы. And, uh, also these uh, are multilateral uh, negotiations. So there are different sides so partaking in that. It just internally we have different sides. There are uh, Congress, uh, legislative body, there is President office, there are people, and also there are all the guarantors, uh, countries mentioned Israel, Great Britain, Poland, Turkey, uh, NATO, United States, and probably all the countries of the United Nations of the Does uh, Russian Federation accept the conditions of other countries? Well, Russia is in a precar precarious position because they are being sanctioned uh, and also accused by United Nations, so Russia is taking an interesting position. If we'll be flexible here, maybe you can start removing some sanctions. Because, um, you know, there, <laughs> there's really, there used to be no hope just a few days ago. I don't see sanctions being lifted soon. Um, I think they're there. Besides, not only because of Ukraine, but, you know, peace agreement is uh, definitely a hope, because otherwise it's just a broken economy. In two months they'll start feeling it real sharp. So as initially they were pushing for the direct negotiations and maybe a chance for Zelensky to leave Kiev, now there is, there is a risk for Putin to agree to come to these uh, negotiations, and I'm sure he's afraid uh, going to these negotiations, uh, afraid for his life. But, you know, frankly, I'm probably a, he's, he should probably be afraid more than uh, he would not be let back in Russia if he leaves it. Uh, frankly, you know, uh, he probably should be afraid more of being uh, welded shut in his bunker because, uh, you know, he, there actually are some rumors that he's there with his uh, Alina Kabaeva, with his lover. So, also about Biden and his weapon support to Ukraine and some news that are coming. Um, you know, frankly, I will not believe that until I see the order. Until I see the weapons here in Ukraine, I'll remain skeptical. You know, yeah, there is a saying, if you're so smart, show me the money. Yeah, show me the money. I think the perspective is, do you think it's weak? No, I think the perspective exists. But war is not only about these material things, it's also about the speed, the tempo. Of course, the West will get there, but uh, the question is when. Because daily, while they're still sitting on the fence, there are kids and civilians dying. Uh, they did declare us to be part of Europe. So, yeah, there are European kids dying here daily, and they're still thinking whether to give us a piece of metal to protect them. Um, we actually have 160-something thousand people watching us live. I think the whole Minister of Defense of Russia perhaps is watching. We're 20 minutes live. Um, how much more time do we have? Um, we have probably about five minutes. All right, so we discussed that. So you think that Poland, who keeps initiating the possibility uh, of uh, bringing peacekeepers to Ukraine. You think that initiative is also will believe it when it happens? You know, things happen with time. Biden said a very important thing yesterday, uh, that if there'll be a chemical weapon used, um, we shall intervene. And that's good. It's at least some ghostly opportunity for NATO to be involved, because earlier they were saying we will, shall not intrude even if there'll be nuclear weapon use. Why? Uh, perhaps, I think, Poles explained that uh, according to their uh, military intelligence, Poland is next if Ukraine loses. So the question then is uh, how much of Russian army will be left when it gets there. So that's a fact for them.
One more important thing to consider, the uh, Russian Empire won all of its victories when Ukraine was part of it. Um, that's the thing about the Red Army, that every second officer was Ukrainian, because there's something about uh, our nation, our people. Uh, they're, they're twisting it, right, so in Russia that they're not Ukrainians, they're just Ukrainian roots. They're actually saying that these were not Ukrainians, uh, that those officers had Ukrainian last names. Of course. Uh, one more thing. One of the commanders who took nine capitals uh, back in the day, Mr. Paskevich, from Poltava, he was an Ukrainian guy. So you have to understand that they also have uh, a perspective of not a full-fledged partisan war, and let's take a fiction that Ukraine loses. We won't, but let's just imagine it for a second. Let's imagine that Ukrainians will join 1.5 million Russian army, but there are 400,000 men, if Russia somehow manages to bring back Ukraine like USSR did, uh, and that will be right on the border of Europe. I don't know how they'll be holding off that threat with their bare naked armies. So for them, perspective is pretty simple. If Ukraine falls, eventually that could mean the end of Europe, because Russia can continue you know, with the hybrid, half-hybrid wars to eat uh, on the countries of Baltic Sea. That's, I think, what Poland and other neighbors are trying to push this uh, concept to Biden and further partners uh, to help Ukraine finish this thing here. Maybe stop it with our blood, but stop it here in Ukraine. Give us the weapons. Give us that metal. We'll, we don't need the no-fly zone. We know how to shoot them, and we'll shoot more. We'll do it with our own hands. Just help us with the weapons. Otherwise, you know, kids are still dying from dehydration, for God's sake. The theater in Mariupol where the bomb destroyed and uh, there are hundreds of people dead. There are actually pregnant women there hiding, and that's where the bomb fell. You know, they're saying beautiful things in NATO and taking pictures how they support us in words. Don't support us with your words. We would really appreciate if you can send us some ammo and weapons. And we'll protect us ourselves. Uh, the last question. There are a couple of minutes left. So the discussion about possibility of using nuclear weapons by Moscow and uh, advancement from just threats to the actual use. This conversation is a very sharp face. All kinds of analytics are discussing it. Do you think that during that war, the threat of uh, use of the nuclear Weapons by Moscow, it grew? No, uh, I would say this threat diminished. If it is pushed out now to the media, it is less. They'll be scaring people with it to the very end of war and a little bit after. Hey, we lost, yes, but if you will touch us again, we'll shoot our nukes at you. So that will be part of the informational propaganda and uh, part of information accusations of uh, one side or another. But uh, I don't think there will be a threat of a nuclear war. So there are, uh, there's almost 181,000 live viewers. Uh, we will not exploit you further. We've been a couple hours late today. You know, it's war, so things happen and things get delayed. We're sorry, but we're doing our best. Thank you, Alexei, and tomorrow we'll do it in our usual time at 21, right? Okay, great. I'll see you tomorrow. I understand you. Okay. See you tomorrow. Goodbye, everybody.